My Gavan and Melanine and well met indeed. I am Arakia Galadirathan, the head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, but welcome back to another Lord of the Rings lore video. A video to give you a little bit of information about the backstory of the game we all play. Uh, today's lore video will be slightly different in that it's not just um, generally me talking through a story or something that has happened in Middle-earth or, or a character, their bio or anything like that. This time it's a bit different in an attempt to build up the um, video to Feanor, which will be next. Um, we're going to do a video about essentially the written word of Middle-earth. Um, this is going to focus heavily on Tengwar because Tengwar is essentially the written word. There are of course Kirth um, or Kirthas or Angirthas runes of Moria that the dwarves do use and I'll touch upon those but nothing in great detail here. Additionally I'm not going to go into ultra mega depth um, <laughs> about this so um, like for example when we come onto the Tengwa the, the stem and the curve of the Tengwa is that I mean they've got names and there's and there's backstories behind those but we won't get into that I'm not going to go into massive detail and bore you with words that don't really mean anything to you uh, but we're just going to have a little look at um, Tengwa itself the first of all the history of it the actual language itself and therefore um, and thereby rather languages of all uh, Middle Earth, the written version of these languages. And then we'll get on to a little bit about one of the modes of Tengwa, and I'll give you general rules. So by the end of it, you should have a bit of an understanding of um, what the elves actually write in in Middle Earth. And then indeed, you should be able to transcribe your own language, if it's English, into this, as I'll give you the rules around that. So let us begin then. Well, the word Tengwa itself, let's start with that. Tengwa is a Quenyan or a high elven word and literally just means letters. And indeed, when you're talking about Tengwa, um, the Tengwa are the actual letters that you use. They are the alphabet, if you will, of the language. Um, and it was first created um, in the first age by an elf called Rumil. Now, Rumil isn't really important enough to have an image of his own, um, but he's credited as being the first elven poet. And he actually wrote, or is credited with writing, the Aina Lindale, which is the creation story of Middle-earth. Tolkien's very keen on writing stories for Middle-earth and then imposing them in the story themselves. So writing, for example, the creation of his world, but then ascribing that story to a character in his world rather than he himself telling you this is what happened. He's telling you this is what this elf is telling you is ha what happened. And Rumel is credited with being the writer of the Aina Lindale, the creation of Middle-earth. Obviously he didn't create it, he wrote the story of the creation. Now Rumel actually created the first written script used by any language. So similar to, I don't know, on the Babylonians, the first writers of um, script in our realm, in our world. Uh, but Rumil is credited with being the creator. However, when describing Tengwa and, and indeed describing any written script, uh, Fianor usually steals this thunder. Uh, because Rumil um, went to Valinor with all the elves at the start, or all of the elves that accepted the journey, and he created his script, he created these stories, and Fianor took his script and edited it, changed it quite a bit, um, reorganised it, restructured some of them the way that it worked, and then, so it kind of became his script. So although he's not the original creator, uh, he, he normally gets credit for the creation of this written script, and it's, as I say, it's called Tengwa, uh, T-E-N-G-W-A-R. So Fionor, very much known for the creation of this script, and that's how this video lends itself to then speaking of Fionor next time, because it gives you an idea that Fionor was a creator, um, arguably one of the greatest smiths of all time in Middle Earth history, save for the Maya and the Valar. Um, Fionor is the, is the greatest. He creates all number of things, and indeed, of course, he creates the Silmaril, which eventually leads to the entire storyline, basically, of the uh, First Age. Um, and indeed, he's credited with some pretty heinous acts, uh, killing other elves, things like that. Uh, there's curses upon his sons. He's got a very interesting little story, but it starts all off with him wanting to create things. And the writing system is one of those things that he created. So, Fionor um, was a Noldorian elf. And he actually led the Noldor in exile when they were um, when they chased Melkor out of Val uh, Valinor. Well, they didn't chase him, but they followed Melkor out of Valinor. Uh, he was banished to the town of Formanos. Um, and then eventually, is when Melkor stole the Silmaril, he then chased Melkor across the sea to Middle-earth. However, in so doing, um, this is where the kin slaying of Alqualonde comes into the story, and Fionor stole boats from the Teleri so that they could sail the sea back to Middle-earth. And for this, they're banished eternally. 
Um, but what they bring with them when they come to Middle-earth is their language and their script. Of course, when the Noldor come back to Middle-earth from Valar, from Valar, from Valinor, uh, there are elves already there because many elves departed from the Great Journey and set up their own realms. And the greatest and chief of these are the Sindar in Beleriand. And once the Noldor arrive with their written script, it then mingles and in many places supersedes the scripts that the Sindar have created themselves. So this is where the Tengwell then diverges into various other forms. Chiefly, the Angerthas of the Dwarves are heavily influenced by the Elves, uh, and there is an entire version of Tengwell called the Mode of Beleriand, we'll touch on that in a moment, which um, is edited and adapted by the Sindar for their purposes and needs. Also, in my opinion, the most boring of all the Tengwell scripts, but um, we'll see when we get there. So as I say, the Noldor come to what was Beleriand. Of course, by the Third Age, the time that most of the games in Middle-earth are all set, this entire map that you see before you now no longer exists. It's all sunk beneath the sea. Uh, to the right-hand side of the map, you can see the Ered Luin, and these are the same Ered Luin that are in the northwest of the map of Middle-earth. Um, so this, the entire continent, this entire part of, of the, the continent, rather, has all been destroyed and sunk beneath the sea. There are a few little islands, like for example Himring becomes an island um, off the coast of Linden in the, um, after the fall of Beleriand, uh, but chiefly all of this is sunk. But this is where the Noldor come. They come in boats and they land on the shores of Beleriand, and the Sindar primarily reside within Doria. This is their realm, it's their kingdom. Now when the Noldor come back, of course Melkor hasn't set up um, massive armies or anything yet, and um, so the Sindar have a relatively peaceful existence. And they allow, they turn themselves to creation as well. And, and they have their own sort of form of writing by the time the Noldor arrive. Uh, and it's called the Alphabet of Diaron. And it's more runic based. Um, and the... But again, as I say, this is adapted and edited and very much influenced by Tengwa when it comes with the Noldor. Uh, additionally, the Noldor's original script, um, which again I'll talk about in a moment, was even adapted by the uh, Sindar in very, very minor ways as well. So they've got their major different version, the mode of Beleriand, and then they've got a minor variance as well. Uh, Tengwa's very, very, very applicable is a word I would choose, and it can be matched to suit almost any kind of form of writing. And there are rules that go between all of the modes, and many of them overlap and crisscross, and it's it's a, it's a really easily mouldable language to fit to any spoken language. Uh, so as I've already said, the elves of um, the Sindar of Doriath, they already had their own language, their own written word. This is called the Alphabet of Diron. Uh, it's also called the Kerthas of Diron because Kerthas is a Quenyan word and it just means runes or runic alphabet. Uh, in Sindarin, the runes are called Kirth, C-I-R-T-H. Um, uh, but Kirthas is the general name given to a runic form of writing. And this is what the elves originally had. However, when the Noldor arrive with their version of Tengwa, um, it merges with this, with the, the rune system that the Sindar use. And from that, we then, that's where Diron's Kirthas comes from. So there was a runic system in, in Beleriand before the elves arrive. Or the Noldor. The Noldor then arrive, Tengwa merges with it, and Diron uses this merging of the two forms of writing to create his alphabet, the Kerthas, which then is so heavily favoured by the dwarves that they adopt it themselves. And it becomes the Angerthas Moria, which just means the um it's got a, it's got a literal translation meaning I can't remember, like long long stem rune system or something like that. But um and before you on the screen is an example of the Angerthas of Moria. Um, and now the Angerthas and Tengwa are as different from one another in the ways that the Roman alphabet and the Chinese script are different. One of them, Tengwa, Chinese script, is more adapted to pen work, to flowing lines. It, it's, it's almost graceful, you might say, as you, as you write it across the page. And the other, the Roman alphabet, and in this case the Dwarven alphabet, the Angerthas, they're both designed more to be carved onto something. They have bold, stark, straight lines. They don't really flow. Um, they, like, their letters don't connect up, as you can see on the screen before you. They're just they're individual lines, individual carvings. And that is, as I say, one of them is more suited to being carved, the other more suited to being drawn. And this is partly why the dwarves favour it so much, because they carve everything. 
Uh, so the Angerthas goes into Moria and becomes that. Now, of course, the Westron, which is essentially English in Middle Earth, they do write in Westron, so they write in English. But they do also then adopt Tengwa as well. So Tengwa becomes very much the kind of formal written language of Middle Earth. And it has its roots and its effects are seen even in the Dwarven writing system. So this is why the, the video is primarily devoted to Tengwa. Oh, I should also just mention as well, this video is likely not to be very long, um, but that's always the way with some of these. Uh, just to actually tell you what it says in front of you, this is the inscription on the tomb in, of Balin. Uh, and it says, Balin fundinul uzbad kazadum ul, which are the first three lines. And then interestingly, it then swaps to English, and at the bottom it says, Balin, son of Fundin, lord of Moria. Now, Tolkien does actually say that it's kind of erroneous, that, um, or an error, essentially, that there's English and Kuzdul present on his tomb. Uh, and it doesn't really appear anywhere else, but it's very, very useful for us. So it literally just means Balin, son of Fundin, Lord of Moria. And then in English, it says the same thing, but both represented by the Angerthas of Moria. Right, let's now finally talk about Tengwa itself. So we've covered the history of Tengwa and we've spoken a little bit about the different paths it's taken with the mode of Beleriand and the classical Quenyan and indeed how it's influenced the Dwarven language. But now let's actually look at Tengwa itself. Well, the first thing that you see on your screens before you um, is the classical or Quenyan mode. So before we get into that, there are three essentially main modes of Tengwa. There's Classical Quenyan, which is the original. There's the mode of Beleriand, which was adapted by the Elves of Doriath. And then finally, there is something called General Use. Now, General Use is the one that's used um, for all of the real-life languages, if you will. Uh, but it is also the one that's used by... Sindarin if you don't use the mode of Beleriand because the Quenyan and Sindarin forms of the classical mode are different. So Tengwar itself in the classical mode was as I say created by Fionor. We've already covered that. Now the reason that it's called classical Quenyan is because Fionor's mother tongue was Quenyan. So the original script was devised to work for Quenya itself and there are a few variations to the Quenyan one that don't really apply to anything else. The chief difference here is that the Quenyan version of Tengwa, the actual letters or the Tengwa themselves have a different meaning to the other variations. Uh, and now when I say Tengwa themselves, before you is obviously a is a, is a, a passage from the Nemarie, a, a poem written entirely in Quenyan, a very famous one. And the symbols that you see before you, the main body of the symbols that you can see with my mouse cursor now that I'm drawing out, these are called the Tengwa. And these, because as I say, it literally means letters. So these are the letters themselves. However, these diacritic marks, which just means symbols above or below, or sometimes even in the letters themselves, uh, these are called the Teta, T-E-H-T-A. And so Tengwa, you can say the Tengwa, because that's the name of the main letters, but you also say Tengwa to describe the writing style, so a double-use word. But um, each of these co uh, corresponds to a sound rather than a direct letter. But then that is where the difference with general use comes. Uh, with the general use Tengwa, the Tengwa themselves tend to ascribe to an individual letter more so than a sound. But at its core, it is based on sounds rather than straight letters, which is why it's so easy to trans to change into any language. But these Tengwa themselves in the classical mode have slightly different meanings than when they're used in the other mode. Only really slight. For example, the D symbol from the general use mode um, means ND in the Quenyan mode. And like just minor little changes like that. But there are some changes there. Uh, so Classical Quenyan was the first. This was written and created by Fionor for Quenya, and it, this is the one that spread throughout, as I've already covered. Uh, and just to read you the little bit of the poem, it is, I laurie lanta lasai surinen yinai unotime ve rama aldaren. And of course it means, ah, like gold for the leaves in the wind, long years numberless as the wings of trees. So this is the first and foremost, this is the first mode. Now let me just very briefly, a break from the narrative to say, I'm not really going to give you the rules around the mode of Beleriand, nor the classical Quenyan mode, nor the black speech version. Um, 
they I'm just going to tell you about them but I will give you a breakdown of the actual rules of writing Tenghua in English so if you're only here just to learn a bit about Lord of the Rings you're not really that interested then by all means um, end the, your viewing once I start talking about the actual rules of the English use version because uh, that is just primarily for those who actually want to learn how to write it so the first mode is Classical Quenyan, and then we come on to the mode of Beleriand. Now, the mode of Beleriand is massively different. And the key difference which you, which you might pick up straight away is there are way less marks above the letters, as you can see. Um, so we go back to the Classical Quenyan, you can see that there's all these symbols above almost every word. Uh, but in the Beleriand mode, there are virtually no symbols. Now this is because in the general use version and the Quenyan version, the Teta go above the or, or below certain consonants so vowels are not represented with their own letter they're represented by a symbol or a mark above a letter and it differs on the varying uh, the positioning of that symbol differs between which use your version you use you are using sorry uh, but the mode of beleriand is the reason why i called it the most boring at the beginning uh, is because the beleriand mode has a letter for every letter so whereas um the Quenyan and Sindarian modes, you'd get the symbols above letters so that e, the vowels wouldn't be part of the body of the word. In the Beleriand mode, they are. So every single one of these symbols uh, is a consonant or a vowel. And the only time that the additional symbols come into play are when there are double vowels in the word or it has an accent. So, for example, in the word Moria, we see that there's an I and an A, and thus the I goes above, a th um, the I and the A are represented by the I going above the A. And there are minor little changes like that, but again, I won't go into too much about the rules of um, the, this mode. Uh, but just know that this mode varies in that massive way. This one is the closest to our own writing style because it is everything is written out in a line. So if a word has four letters, then it will have four letters. Whereas with a Quenyan and Sundarin modes, uh, if it has four letters and two of them are vowels, then there'd only be two letters and then two symbols above them. So it's, it's a bit different. Uh, and this is perhaps the most famous example of the mode of Beleriand Tengwa, and that is the inscription on the doors of Durin. Enun Durin Aran Moria, Pedo Melon Amino, Imnavi Hain Akant, Celebrimbo Oeregian Taithant Ithu Hin. And it, of course, means the doors of Durin, Lord of Moria, speak friend and enter. I, Navi, made them, and Celebrimbo of Oeregian drew these signs. Um, and this shows that the Sindar mode of Beleriand, created when the Noldor came back to Beleriand in the First Age, actually existed into the Second Age with the founding of Oeregian, because Celebrimbo has clearly used the Beleriand mode when carving on the door. So, potentially, well, possibly this mode then sort of died out with the fall of Eregion because we don't know too much, we don't have many more examples of it in the later stages of the Third Age. Uh, so that's the mode of Beleriand, the second um, major mode of Tengwa writing style. And the third is general use. Now, general use can be broken down into almost any language. And I will go on to speak, cover it in English in just a moment. But before we get there, I just want to show you perhaps the most famous example of general use Tengwa writing. And that is, of course, the ring inscription. Uh, the ring inscription is the black speech of Mordor written in Tengwa. So again, there are different rules. I may have stressed this, may not have stressed this enough, but every single version, so classical, Beleriand, general use black speech, general use English, general use Sindarin, they all have their own rule set. They all do things a little bit differently. Certain symbols mean different things. So if you want to write in Tengwa to, and you want to write, say, English or Sindarin, then there are different rules between the two. Essentially, it is, at its core, the same. They all have the same foundation, but there's tiny little minor differences. And again, it's the same with black speech. Uh, this is also, of course, a really stylized, flowing writing style, in the same way that a calligrapher just maybe writes in English, but gives it a real flair. Like when you read old manuscripts from uh, monks from like 700 years ago, and they've written in English. Um, or at least Latin, but you have like there's no way on earth you're going to be able to read it because of the the flowing crazy way they write, and this is the similar sort of thing. Um, but the ring inscription is in Tengwa, and of course, as I say, it's black speech, and this is the general use version or mode. And the general use umbrella covers everything that isn't the original version and the Beleriand version. 
Um, and the ring inscription is, of course, Ash Nazg Debatluk, Ash Nazg Gimpatul, Ash Naz Thrakatluk, Ag Bazam Ishi Krimpatul. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. And that is the sort of third usage, or that helps to explain the third use, the general use. Um, and so those are the general forms of Tengwa. Those are the, the key ones that you're going to come across in if you ever come to read Tengwa or anything like that. Um, but I will now go on to English. Um, oh, sorry, just one little note. Um, because Sindarin is obviously spoken by the Sindar Elves, and the Sindar Elves created the mode of Beleriand, as you see there, um, that's commonly used when writing Sindarin. But I think it's really dull. And because you can write generally, you you can do the other mode for Sindarin. And in fact, it's quite common as well. There's about 50-50 split. Um, to differentiate between the two, rather than calling it general use Sindarin Tengwa, uh, it tends to be called the mode of Beleriand, which is this one, where they're written in lines, and the mode of Gondor, where they're written above or below the letters. Um, so general use Sindarin for Tengwa is, tends to be called the mode of Gondor. But before we move on to then the pure rules of English, there's one final thing about transcribing in Tengwa or writing in Tengwa that is really not really nailed down with the description. And this is the concept of orthography and phonemically writing the word. So orthographically or phonemically writing. And this is a really tricky one. Uh, like in a real pure basic, it's going to hurt experts' ears to hear it kind of dis um, description. Orthographically is the bottom word. So Elendil, if you were to write Elendil orthographically in Sindarin, you would replace every existing letter with a letter of its own. Now, of course, that's not the that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's kind of the rule. So E would have a symbol, L would have a symbol, E would have a symbol, N D I L. All of those. They all have symbols because that's written, that's how orthographically it's written. However, Sindarin is kind of, well not Sindarin, sorry, Tengwa is kind of designed to be written phonemically and this is also true of Angerthas Moria, the, the runes of the dwarves. Um, but we'll start with it, we'll show you this one first. Whenever you see the Elendil written in Tengwa, it's quite famous because Tolkien wrote it himself, um, it's written in this top formation. Now this actually spells out, as I've written next to it, L-N-D-L. Uh, but it means Elendil, and this is the phonemic way of writing it. So it's essentially the sounds, the pure sounds, rather than an actual symbol for every letter. But the joke is that you can use either. You can write phonemically and you can write orthographically. Neither are correct nor incorrect. They're both right, essentially. However, to write phonemically, you've got to have a really clear understanding of if exactly which letters are, are part of which sounds, and you've got to have a real clear, uh, like a really high level of grasp of your own language. And of course, for a student of Sindarin, which isn't even a complete language, that's really tricky. So Sindarin is almost always written orthographically. And a side note, Elendil is actually a Quenyan word anyway, so it's a diff slight difference there. Um, but if you're writing in English, it's almost always better as well to write orthographically, just because it saves you the headache of first having to try and translate to yourself how the word would be said, and then write that out into Sindarin. So it tends to be way easier to write it orthographically. And as I showed you, above and below are the two examples there, written out in Tengwa. So we're going to proceed as if we are going to go <laughs> orthographically, as I say. Um, the example on the Angerthas is that very inscription I showed you on Barlin's tomb, if I slowly plod back through my... Um, uh, the bottom line says Barlin, son of Fundin, uh, but it doesn't say S-O-N, it says S-U-N, because that is actually how you pronounce the word, despite its meaning being different, if it's written out like that. Um, and that's another example of this, albeit slightly different, but it is an example at its core of this, of writing how they're sounded, how they sounded, that it makes sense, writing how they sound rather than how they are spelt. So that says S-U-N, son of Fundin, because as I say, that's how it sounds. So then on to the actual rules themselves and a little bit of a um, 
of a little bit of a distinction between the three. I've got them on the left hand side there. Now, as I may have said, may not have said, what I'm going to explain now is Tenghua when writing in English, because that, I believe, is the most common use that you'd all want it for, uh, like, for example, tattoos and things like that. Um, and this isn't really to make you experts on it, it's just to give you a little bit of a flavour of how to actually write in it. Um, so, this is for English, as I say, general use English. Now, the first and key thing that you need to note are the vowel placements. Now, as I said, the vowels and the diphthongs are um, represented by teta. Um, and these are these little symbols above the stems that you see just here, or, or indeed beneath the stems. And they are the teta. They are diacritics. And you can see them shown in the words lanta and towards, written both over here on the left-hand side. Now, the reason that I've shown you these is because one of the main, uh, one of the other differences between writing in Quenyan, writing in Sindarin and English, is that Quenyan puts the vowel on the letter before it, and Sindarin and English put the vowel on the letter after it. So, as you can see with Lanta, it's A L A N. Oh, that's the N T in one symbol. So it's A L rather than L A, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like. Al, <laughs> rather than la. Uh, so essentially you read up and then across, whereas when reading in Sindarin and English, you read across and then down. Um, that's the best way I can, I can describe it. And this is purely because when you end a word with a vowel, or if you have two vowels next to each other, or and you need the vowel to go on the following consonant, then obviously there is no following consonant. Um, for example, in the word pedo, which hasn't been written out alternatively, but in pedo, yeah, there's an O at the end, so there's nothing for it to go above when writing in the Sindarin and English version. So it goes along one of these carriers here, um, and this it goes very much against Tolkien's desire for everything to flow very nicely. So the general rule is that if your language is vowel heavy, i.e. most words end in a vowel, then the 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 teta go on the consonant before the vowel, such as in Quenyan. Quenyan is a very vowel-heavy language. It ends in a lot of vowels and it uses a lot of vowels. So the vowels go on the consonants before them. Whereas Sindarin and English are more consonantal. They end in consonants more than vowels. So the teta go on the following consonant, as explained, shown with this word towards. So there's the T, and then the O goes on the W, and then the A goes on the R. And then DS. Um, so rather than in Lantar where the A goes on the L. And now it does actually it blow, like you start going in circles when you try and think of this. But it is actually reasonably straightforward when you just sit down and, and think. Um, and then the third example that I'm showing you there. Oh, we've got a loading thing. Is um, of course pedo written in the mode of Beleriand where there are no diacritics. It's literally just P-E-D-O. Um, and written out almost exactly the way we write it but with a different symbol for the letters. So those are the key, that's one of the major core fun, fundamental differences between the languages. And as I say, you neither is particularly right or wrong. You can write Sindarin with the vowels on the consonant before it. And you can do the same with English, but it's just not really done that way. But equally, no one's going to shout at you and tell you off for doing that. It's just not really done that way. So then when coming to actually write, there's a few rules that you can see dotted around the screen that you need to take note of. First... Um, there are some words, these four here, and only these four, that actually have their own little symbol. So and takes that form. You don't actually write out A-N-D, it just takes that little form there. Uh, same with of, the, the, and of. Now, this is English. These are English rules. So whilst a lot of these overlap into Sindarin, um, if you want to write Sindarin into Tegwa, you'd need to research that separately. And there will be three links in the description below of three separate websites that I've used at different times that are all very useful for writing Tegwa. Right, the next rule, and another difference from the classical mode, is the representation of nasal letters. So, if there is a, what's called a nasal consonant, or a, a nasalization, I believe it's called, or something along those lines, um, then rather than writing out ND and both of those being represented, so taking the, te the Tenghua letter for N and putting it before the Tenghua letter for D, instead you just put this flat bar above the consonant that you want to become nasal. Now, this works for both M and N. Uh, and so as you can see there, Rivendell, rather than being um, the N and then the D, it becomes the D with the flat bar above it. 
And now the reason that I say that's different from Quenyan is because in Quenyan the symbol for D is the symbol for ND already. You don't need to alter it. So in Quenyan the D symbol is actually ND, not simply just D. It's a minor little change. But so the first rule is the nasalization. The second rule is that if you have two consonants next to one another, they are represented with a line, it's exactly the same type of line, but this time underneath the consonant. So the B is doubled with the line going underneath it, the P is doubled with the line going underneath it. And you can play around with where you put this. Like I've seen um, the L, I have seen doubled with a line going actually underneath the L, but also just coming out underneath the bar there and going out that small gap. So you can play around with it if you want to, um, depending on how you want it to look. Uh, an additional rule is if you have an S at the end of a word, you can represent it with an S, but in, you would normally represent it with this little additional flick. So that just shows that there's an S ending that word. Um, this X is this backward sort of drop down here. Um, because X isn't uh, X isn't represented at all in Sindarin or Quenyan, the actual languages. So X is a purely English Tenghua symbol that's probably not even made by Tolkien, who, who even knows. Um, and so that represents your X. It's a totally unique symbol because, as I say, it doesn't exist in Sindarin or Quenyan. And finally, if you have a W following a consonant, like in the word two, or if you just have the W sound following a consonant, like in the word equal, um, equal is obviously e q u a l, but it is sound. It is spoken as if it is eek wal w a l, um, and that's an area where the sort of phonemic way of writing can creep in. Uh, but if you do have a situation where there's a w or a w sound following a consonant, then it's represented by this kind of a joined Nike ticks. So two ticks back to back joined together, and they go above the consonant that's about to be um, changed. And that presents the W symbol. Uh, the final thing, which unfortunately isn't represented here, or the penultimate thing, sorry, is the letter S, um, the letter C, sorry, but when spoken like an S. So, for example, in the word city, I've gone back. In the word city, the C is pronounced like an S, but that is not represented in the Tenghua um, because whilst Sindarin and Quenyan do have the letter C, it's pronounced as a K. So the C sound doesn't have its own symbol. So for English, something had to be created. And all you do is you flip the S upside down. Uh, so if you were writing the word city, it would begin with an upside down one of those. And in an example that I'm about to show you, that is present. So you can see that in place. And then finally, the last little rule for um, writing in the English style is this upside down E. Uh, oh no, not the final, I've not told you about the carriers yet, but there's upside down E. So if you have a word where the E isn't actually really voiced, it's called a voiceless E, then that is represented by a dot underneath the letter. And a clean example of this is the word Rivendell. In the word Rivendell, the E isn't really spoken. It's kind of like V-N-D, Rivendell. You don't particularly say or stress the E at all. So in that situation, the E here would just be a dot underneath the ND symbol because ND comes after the E. So the vowel symbol affects this grouping and it would go underneath it because it's a voiceless E. So then actually, finally, the last rule is that if a vowel going on the following consonant, if there is no following consonant, like at the end of a word or two vowels next to each other, then it goes on a carrier. So you simply just draw a line and do a thing, which unfortunately gives the eye the exact look of an eye in English, which I've always <laughs> not really liked. But there we are. <laughs> That's by the by. Right. So those are the rules. You can check them all out on the website anyway. And just to give you a representation of that, here is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 1, um, translated into or transcribed into Tengwa. Now, this has been taken off of the Tenghua, I believe, Wikipedia page, actually, but it's such a useful paragraph to show you the rules because so many rules are present in this one paragraph that it works so well. So on the right-hand side there, you can see what it actually means. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. But over on the left, is it written out exactly in Tenghua and quite, um, oh dear, I've left the internet open, and working as it should. So 
as you can see, there's two L's. So the first rule we come across is the L has been doubled with a line just underneath it. And there's the A above it going on the following consonants. We move on to human standard H U M A N. Nothing special there. That's just a basic, simple word. And then we come on to beings where another rule is present. So we've got the B. The E goes on a carrier because it comes before a vowel. And then the I goes on the NG, um, which has its own symbol. So whereas some letters are, are made nasal by the addition of the bar above them, other letters are just already nasal. Like certain letters are already grouped and one symbol will, can mean two letters already. And NG is an example of that. Uh, and then it has an S off the end there, the little flick. Uh, the R is represented like that because, as you say, as I've already said, the E in the R, in the word R, is not pronounced. It's, it doesn't have any impact on the word at all. Uh, so it goes underneath rather than on its own carrier, representing the voiceless E. And then B-O-R-N, another standard word. Free is represented like that, F-R, and then two carriers because there's no consonant. And has its own symbol, as we've already seen. And then here you go with the equal that I was talking about. So E is going above the Q-U, but Q-U has the sound of Q-W. So it's written the symbol for a Q, um, but then with the symbol that alters it to make a W sound. So it's E-Q-W-A-L, which is eek wow which becomes equal. And this is an example of where the, the words can be written as though the as they are sounded rather than as they are spelt, which does creep in in quite a few places. So writing in Tenghua is a massive mix of writing out ex like literally letter for letter and also writing out sound for letter. So it can be it can take some getting used to, but it's not too difficult. Uh, then there's the word in, which is again normal, dignity, which is again normal, D-I-G, N I T and then Y. I didn't touch upon the Y, but if the Y is in a Y, it can take the form of a consonant or a vowel. In the word dignity, Y is essentially a vowel. It has the same sound as an I. So in that sense, it then gets its own vowel symbol and it acts like a vowel. So it takes a carrier and goes at the end. However, in the word they, for example, Y is a consonant. Um, and as we'll see in just a moment, um, it's then represented by a different symbol, which is the consonantal version of a Y. <laughs> I apologise for how wordy this all is, but I did just want to cover this. And for those of you that should be taking notes, I hope, and then um, this will be more than helpful. Uh, so dignity is all fine. And again, represented by its symbol there, as you can see. And then finally, rights. R-I-G-H-T-S. Again, G-H is represented by its own symbol, not by a standard letter. Uh, and there are a few of those rules not dotted around. There's a couple of places where two letters will be represented by a single symbol and you should get them um, on the list that you see here. For example, there you go. There's G-H Agast um, written there. And there are there are various others. There's N-G written at the end there as well. But if you go back then. So this little symbol, a colon with a, where there's only one dot, is a full stop. Um, and that, that can that goes where there would be a full stop. Then you, there's no capital letters as well. This is a big uh, something. It took me a long time to get around. Uh, there just aren't capital letters. They just don't do that. So um, the sentences don't start with them. There's no capital letters used for names or anything like that. I mean, you can possibly write the first symbol larger, but I've never seen it done. I've never seen it done. I'm, I, I don't believe they... Even in Tolkien's own Tenghua writings, he never capitalises. He never makes any letter bigger than any other by way of giving that a highlight. So I don't think there is any capitalization. Uh, but then there's T-H-E-Y and there's the Y in its consonantal form. And then it moves on to A-R-E and the E again is voiceless. We've seen this um, word already. Our. R, sorry. Our born. And we are now at R endowed. Now, this is just highlighting the two different versions of the letter R, which is, again, very annoying. But there are two variations of the letter R. Now, them both being present in the same in two representations of the same word is incorrect. But this is just to show you all of the letters. Um, but and where you use the R depends upon certain rules again. But they're explained on the on the websites that I will link below because I don't want to go into outrageous detail. Um, but rest assured, you can essentially use any. Um, the general principle is that if the R is at the start of the word, then it takes this kind of Y symbol. And if the R is at the end of the word, it takes this symbol. Um, and then where it goes in the middle is up, up and down, really. 
Uh, endowed, you can see that it's an N D, it's that nasal D, so it takes a bar over the D. End out, and again the E is voiceless, so it goes underneath. Endowed, but it follows the same principle that it goes on um, whatever is coming next, except the voiceless E will tend to go on what comes before it. But there are um, places where both happen, so it's uh, it's again a tricky one. Um, but normally, if it's a voiceless E, it will go before. So you will get that symbol where you get a vowel, then something, then a vowel underneath. Uh, so that's the only place where you'd normally see a vowel before in writing Sundarin in English. Uh, endowed with, again, this is a symbol for TH rather than just T. Uh, so you can use that. So it becomes W I T H R E A S O N. Uh, this is an example of a diphthong, which is two vowels next to one another that are represented by a single symbol. Of course, it's not really a single symbol, single symbol. There are only certain diphthongs. As you saw at the beginning, beings is not represented by a single symbol. And this is because beings are their separate sounds, whereas in the word reason, it is a single sound. And that's a bare, again, very core, fundamental, basic example of a diphthong. It's a single sound, but it is actually two letters. And reason, E-A in this case, is an example. And those are represented slightly differently. Um, if there's a whole little batch of them, but normally if it's E or I-A or, or if it's any diphthong that ends in an A, it will take this little curl symbol and then whatever the other vowel was will have its normal symbol. So here you can see that's just a normal symbol for an E on top of this curl, which is the A. Uh, and again, there are, you, I didn't want to go into a massive detail again, but you can check that one out and read up on the diphthongs. But if in doubt, it's not the end of the world to represent even diphthongs by the separate vowels. People will still understand what you mean. Um, it's just that there is a slightly better way to do it. Uh, again, and is its own word. And then we come to conscience. This is the C that I pointed out. It literally is just the upside down S. And you can see it at the end there as well. And this is the C taking on the sound of an S. But obviously it's literally, it is a different letter. Um, but the C at the beginning takes on the sound of a K. So it's represented by the K symbol. And that's how Tengwa deals with that situation in English. So... Uh, the letter C itself doesn't really have its own tengwa unless it is, unless it takes on the sound of an S, where it has the upside down or a nine basically. Uh, so C O N S C I E N C, and then a voiceless E finishing off the word conscience. Again, and on its own, S H. Now this is another situation that is ever slightly different. So we've got an S at the front there. And next to that, we've then got an O and a U together. But again, they don't have separate sounds. Should. It's an O sound. And again, it's a diphthong, which is why it's represented in here with the O symbol. And then the symbol underneath is um, making that the diphthong. So it's should. And there's L and there's D. So SH are their own symbol represented by the kind of D looking symbol. And then there's a diphthong and then LD. So should. Uh, A-C-T, nothing particularly special about that. Um, that's just, and again, a very basic representation of writing in Tengwa. Same with towards, T-O-W-A-R-D, and there's the S finishing off the word. And then we come on to the word one, which is simply just O-N and then a voiceless E. Another A-N-O-T-H, voiceless E, and there's an R. Uh, potentially then the R's are the other way around, but he's used different R's at different places. Um, there's, he's not really following... I don't know actually who wrote this. I did just take it from Wikipedia. I didn't write it myself. But um, my understanding was that this R is used either, either at the beginning or at the end, but not both. Uh, and this version of the letter R is used where you don't use this one. So if this one was used first, this one's used last and vice versa. Uh, but he's used them, oh, he or she has used them in either location. So it could be alter, it could be changed on a different, could be different, could be written differently depending on different rules which I'm unaware of. Maybe something to do with the vowels. Uh, so that's another. And then I, N, again, simple word. And then A is totally on its own, so it takes a carrier there. And then we come to spirit. S-P-I-R-I-T. Again, very basic representation. Of is its own symbol represented there. And then finally, B-R-O-T-H, voiceless E, R-H, double O, and D. Now, the final thing just to say on that then is when you get two vowels next to one another, the, but there's no consonant after them, then they take individual stems, 
when you get two vowels next to each other, but there is a consonant after them, then they double up on top of that consonant. Sorry, I've done it again. Um, so if free were the word freed, it would have that ending. So it would be fr and then that symbol, uh, but with the i's instead of the o's. But if there's no consonant following, they go on their own carriers. And that is it. So I do thoroughly hope that you've enjoyed listening to me um, talk about Tenghua. I really, really, really like Tenghua. It was something I learned way before I even started dabbling in Sindarin. And um, I, th I even signed my name in Tenghua, but so far no one has ever yet to notice that. Uh, but then who, who would know that, really, let's be honest. Um, so I do hope you've enjoyed it. Feedback, as ever, is always welcome. And I wanted to do this one on Tenghua to lead in, of course, to Fianor, who will be next, uh, because he created the script. This script you see before you right now on the left-hand side was a creation of Fianor. Uh, obviously, Rumil created it first. Fianor took it on. But it's Fianor we're chiefly concerned with, and in the next video will be devoted to him and his life. Um, I, won't all, I won't then do kind of like his family's problems. Um, I'll just do Fianor himself. And then potentially after that, we'll move on to then what happens with his sons. Because there's a lot of them and they have a lot of troubles. Um, but for now, that will be all. So thank you very much for watching, if indeed you have. And until we speak again, dear friends, Navar, Naden, Peremad, Melunin, and farewell. <laughs>